All right, everyone, welcome to our second module homework demonstration. This is the module for the fallacies. What we're going to do in this video is I've pulled a few uh, homework problems at random. We're going to work our way through them. I'm going to explain my thinking and show you how to identify a fallacy. So here's the first one. This is on page 161. And uh, here it goes. Your Honor, it's true that I killed my parents. I fully admit that I murdered them in cold blood, but I should get a light sentence. After all, I'm an orphan. It's kind of funny. Why, why is he an orphan? <laughs> because he killed his parents. <laughs> it's his own fault. Sorry, this is kind of dark humor. I don't know why. Uh, it was a random pick. So what should we, what's wrong with this? Obviously there's something wrong. We need to figure out what exactly. Um, is it relevant that he's an orphan? Is it relevant to his sentence? And the answer to this is maybe. It might be, but you would need some kind of connection. You would need some kind of bridge to get you from orphan to lighter sentence. So what is it exactly that being an orphan is supposed to do here? I think it's designed, and of course this is a terrible, doing a terrible job of it, but I think it's designed to get the judge to feel sorry for him. Right? Like, oh, well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be mean to an orphan, right? Like, you should feel sorry for me. You should do nice things for me because I, I'm a disadvantaged person. I'm an orphan. And I, I think that's what this is. In that case, this is an argumentum ad misericordium. This is an appeal. This is an argument that is to pity, to um, compassion, right? So this is an argument to compassion. Because it's possible that being an orphan should mean that you get a light sentence, but we would need some kind of connection to show why being an orphan is relevant. And in this case, being an orphan is completely irrelevant because the reason he's an orphan is due to the crime itself that he committed. So him being an orphan is not relevant to the sentence that he should be getting. You can see this in other cases too. Uh, Often politicians will make claims like this. They'll say, well, think of, you know, and insert some cause here. It could be anything. It could be um, the poor. It could be the environment. It could be an uh, issue with um, uh, borders or race relations. Anything, really, that would involve someone's compassion and pity. I mean, think, think of... Uh, think of the people that are in hospitals that are unable to, to pay their, their bills. Or think of high school students in underperforming school districts. Um, we should feel some compassion for, for people that are in, in a tough situation. Um, now, what happens a lot of times with these arguments is you take a completely rational feeling of compassion. And then you go directly from that to this particular action, whatever that action is. So in the case of saying, well... Um, um, so uh, let's say let's let's say you're worried about the homeless people. So you're a politician saying we need to, you know the, the the plight of the homeless. It's really bad, and so what we're going to do is confiscate everybody's house, um, and then give those houses to the homeless people. And it's like, well, wait a minute, is that actually going to help them? Isn't that going to create a whole bunch of more homeless people? Like everybody that has a house now is going to become homeless. We've just taken all their houses away and given them to the homeless people. Uh, are we sure this is going to help? Is is this the best way to do it? And then they say, well, wait a minute. You know, why are you questioning this? I mean, do do you not care? Do you hate the homeless people? It's like, well, of course you don't hate the homeless people. It's just you can't move directly from compassion, pity, misericordium, move directly from there into and now do this. We need to show that that action actually will help them. Actually, will make the situation better. And without that. You have the fallacy, argument and misericordium, Ar argument to pity. Okay, let's try the next one. This is on page 174. Oh, this is, this is kind of funny. Uh, the average Brazilian has 1.9 children. Maria is an average Brazilian. So therefore, Maria has 1.9 children. <laughs> like, what happened to the <laughs> tenth of a child? Yeah, so what's the problem here? Uh, this one is this one's kind of funny. Um, the appeal, average Brazilian, right? This is a collective idea, right? This is this is a Brazilians as a whole, and then Maria though, she's a part of that collective, but she's not the same as that collective. So if you take the average Brazilian having 1.9 children, Maria 
is not the average Brazilian. She's Maria, right? And Maria is going to have some things that are different from the average. For example, uh, you could say that the average height, the average Brazilian is, you know, five, you know, we'll say it's five foot ten. I don't know. Brazilians, I guess, are pretty tall. So we'll say their average Brazilian is five foot ten. Well, that means Maria is also five foot ten. It's like, well, well, no, right? Like that's that's not how that works, right? Like um, being average doesn't mean average in everything. It doesn't mean that you're identical to the average in every way. Uh, this would be like saying, um, you know, home should be a place full of love. So we need to hug every brick that we build. It's like, no, no, of course not. The, the, the home as a whole is going to be full of love. But that doesn't mean that every brick, every screw, every nail, or every bit of drywall is, has been loved. I mean, that, that doesn't make any sense. This is the fallacy of division. This is where you take a property of the whole and you apply it to the part. So the whole is Brazil. The part here is Maria. This is the fallacy of division. All right. Um, on page 189, you'll see this one. Uh, uh, I, this is the problem with rent. You get some really wild stuff. So here we go. Uh, on Monday, Bill drank scotch and soda and noticed that he got drunk. On Tuesday, Bill drank whiskey and soda and noticed that he got drunk. On Wednesday, Bill drank bourbon and soda and noticed that he got drunk. Bill concluded that soda causes drunkenness. <laughs> it's, the, it's the only thing in common, right, between all three events. Uh, yeah, this one's pretty funny. Um, what's going on here? Well, what, what's Bill's mistake, right? He's, he's taking a look at some evidence, right? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, he gets drunk each time. He's drinking, looks like, scotch, whiskey, and bourbon. It reminds me of that song, right? One bourbon, one scotch, one one beer, something like that. Anyway, uh, yeah, so so what's the mistake? Well, uh, it's true that every time he got drunk, he was drinking soda. That's true. Uh, but it's not the soda that caused it. The soda was correlated with getting drunk. It happened at the same time, but it wasn't the cause. All right, so that makes this a post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy, a false cause fallacy. One way people explain this one is they say correlation is not causation. Just because two things happened at the same time does not mean that one caused the other. I mean, it might. They might. That might be a coincidence. You might have one instead of one causing the other. It might be the other way around. Uh, it might be connected to it in some way like it's not that drinking soda was completely disconnected uh, but it was actually something in common between the scotch the whiskey and the bourbon and that thing in common was of course ethanol <laughs> uh, poor bill so yeah he made the mistake because he thought that correlation is the same as causation it's not it's a false cause fallacy just because two things are correlated, because they happen at the same time, they're connected in some way, does not mean one causes the other. So there you go. You have to um, be kind of like a detective and try to figure out what these things are. Um, you'll find once you get some practice at this, you'll start to notice fallacies everywhere. It's, uh, it's remarkable how often they show up. And uh, my advice to you is don't become the teenage driver's ed student, right? Like when, when you were a teenager and you were taking your driver's lessons and you're in the car with someone, you notice all sorts of little things that they do wrong and you point it out to them. It's like, oh, you didn't turn your blinker on 100 feet before the, the uh, before you, you turned or you, you didn't come to a complete stop for three seconds, the, that stop sign, you know? Like you start to do, oh, you paralleled parked. I mean, this isn't between six and 18 inches from the curb. And it drives everybody crazy. No one wants to be around the driver's ed, teenage driver's ed student. Don't be the teenage driver's ed student when it comes to fallacies. If people are using, no, you notice someone commits a fallacy somewhere, don't interrupt them and say, well, uh, it's uh, ad hominem, you know, or something like, just, just let it go, you know. Uh, the trick is not to use them yourself and uh, not to be taken in by them when it matters. Anyway, 
Uh, hope this was helpful to you. Good luck with the uh, with the homework assignment. And as usual, use the homework forum if you get stuck. A lot of times your fellow students will be able to help. And if not, the instructor will be able to step in. All right. I'll see you all next week.